Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you all here at All Saints, um, especially if you're new. But I always say that, but if you're old, no, that doesn't work, does it? But, you know, if you're regular members of our congregation, it's fabulous to see you. If you're visiting us as part of this amazing event, it's great to see you as well. Uh, my name's Father Ryan, and I'm the vicar here. Um, we're quite excited to be putting on these new series of lectures. Uh, what we want to do, sort of in term time, if you're thinking of academic term times, we want to be putting on three different lectures um, at those points, um, choosing issues that contemporary uh, faith and culture and society in the church are wrestling with and talking through and exploring. Um, so this, uh, this uh, series, we've got Queer Theology, a three-part lecture uh, series. We've got Charlie here with us today, who I'll introduce in a minute. And then on the 3rd of November, we've got Hannah Cartwright, uh, and she'll be talking about queer calling, the priestly character of queer Christians. And then on the 1st of December, we've got Lyndon Webb, who will be talking about gorgeous bodies. You know, well, that's quite nice. Uh, queer ecologies in the Song of Songs. So I think it's going to be really provocative and exciting and expanding for us as we hear uh, these lecture things. So Charlie's going to come and talk to us today. It's great to have you here, Charlie. Uh, Charlie is an academic cl clinical fellow in psychiatry at South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust and King's College London. He's also the John Marks Fellow, uh, College Lecturer and Director of Studies in Medicine at Girton College, Cambridge. How do you... <laughs> I can only manage one. <laughs> and in, if that wasn't enough, in 2021, he was ordained priest in the Church of England and is serving his curacy in the Diocese of Southwark. Um, and his book, Queer Holiness, The Gift of LGBTQI People in the Church, is fabulous. So get it. You might even get a signed copy. Oh, you might do. So, Charlie, I'll just hand over to Thanks. you. And um, it's great to have you here. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thanks very much indeed for having me. Um, so it's really great to be back in Hove. I was just saying that I think the last time I was in this parish... I grew up in Haywards Heath, and I was a chorister in Chichester. And one of the last times, if not the last time I was in this parish, was standing over there singing the Messiah. Uh, and Neil Jenkins was singing the tenor part of the Messiah. And I remember one of his buttons popping off during the service <laughs> and thinking, this is marvellous. And I've got this very strong image of this parish church. And it's lovely to return to somewhere um, which has formed, in many ways, as being a part of a diocese which was very, very important to me, uh, as a child and in many ways remains so. My mother still lives just down the road in Worthing. So um, it's, it's great to be with you um, and it's great to be with you to talk about something um, which is uncomfortable in a sense. Uh, it's uncomfortable from a, from, from a variety of reasons. It's uncomfortable because um, in the church talking about LGBTQI things and I use that phrase, I use that, that sort of, um, that, that group of letters in a sort of general way. Um, queer is probably easier, but some people don't like the word queer, so I don't, I, please don't read anything into the, what word I use, uh, but that's, um, if I'm referring to LGBTQI in this lecture, that's probably easier. So it's really difficult to talk about those things in the context of the church, because um, it's become a hot, well, it's remained a hot topic for many years, it feels very uncomfortable still, um, and being uh, gay in the church remains a problem for many people, and uh, those of us who are and who are open about it are often told that we are tearing the fabric of the church apart and the rest of it. So it's difficult from the church perspective, but it's also difficult from a societal perspective now to talk about the church in some ways, but also to talk about its relationship to queer issues and to LGBTQI issues. And I see this from my work. Um, so, for example, uh, so as, uh, as has been said, I, I work as a psychiatrist on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, well, and several other things, but that's my kind of, that's what, that's what pays the bills mostly. Um, if at work I used a quarter of some of the language which is used about me in either official or unofficial communiques from the church, I'd be sacked, not disciplined, I'd be sacked. And so it's, that is how far society has changed. Um, and some people may, may moan about that, some people may, may bewail those changes, but that is where we are. So actually having these conversations in many ways, um, whereas in the church I sometimes feel like a kind of dangerous radical, in wider society I'm, all, I'm quite dull really. Um, as in some of the things that we'll talk about 
or what I'll try and talk to you about today, are things which the rest of the world have begun or have got beyond in many ways. Now, that's not to say that LGBTQI people don't still suffer uh, discrimination and prejudice. They do. Um, I've, I have been the victim. It sounds terribly sort of, um, uh, you know, self uh, or self-obsessed, but I have been the victim of hate crime from an LGBTQI perspective. Um, you know, I've been spat at and the rest of it, walking down my own road in London um, in a nominally, um, you know, liberal part of, of the world. So we need to remember that, that this is by no means settled in, in this country, in this context, but more widely, the church is out of step. Now, one of the first things that people will then say, and I want to push back against it strongly, is so you're wanting to change the church to fit in with what the world wants. And what I want to say from the outset today is that is not, and has never been, where I'm coming from. Where I'm coming from is saying what we learn from the world and what we learn from our scientific endeavour and our sociological endeavour and our understanding of human community and social engagement cannot be separated from what we do in the theology that we preach, teach, understand and learn. And so I'm not saying that because the world thinks something is excellent, we in the church must therefore immediately say it's excellent and find ways of enga engaging with it. But what I am saying is that we can't just pretend that that work or that change hasn't happened. So that's my first point. I don't want to start from a perspective of uh, the world is, everything is marvellous and we just need to find ways to, to just become like the world. I don't think that's what we're called to. The second point is, though, that there is a difference between holiness and purity. Um, what we often describe as holiness within the church is actually a form of purity culture. So um, we will often be, will often say, we don't want, we want, we must stand apart from the world. We must be something different from the world. We must stand against. We must be countercultural. That wonderfully overused phrase. We must be countercultural. Being countercultural for its own sake is a form of purity culture. And a form of purity culture is not, resolutely not, what the Bible teaches, resolutely not what the fathers and mothers taught in the early church, and resolutely not what runs through the best themes of Christian theology. So we're not talking about a purity culture. But what I want to think about, and why I used it in the, the title of this book, is what we mean by the phrase or the word holiness. Being set apart, but not being pure away from something by virtue of simply being away from it. So that's another thing. So we're not going to say that we have to do everything because the world tells us, and we're not going to try and become something pure for its own sake. So those two things out of the way. However, what one of my key points and one of the key things which I've tried to say in this book, which I'll try not to refer to too much, I'm not referring to it as a sort of Please buy it, although please buy it. Um, <laughs> but I'm referring to it as much because this is m years of catharsis in one book. Um, and because this, I think, fills a slight gap from where some of the relationship between world and church interact. And so that's why I wrote it. And so if I'm referring to the book, it's because I've perhaps worked these things out in more detail in the book than I might go through today. So, um, so... I, I think we need to address our theology to a world that exists rather than a world that we think or wish existed. That's my number one um, contention. And if nothing else, that's what this book is trying to argue. And for me, one of the key problems that as a church we've um, failed in is actually knowing what it is we're talking about in the first place. So a very simple set of uh, examples. Um, so uh, as has been said, I, I, for my sins, I lecture in Cambridge. They've just called us assistant professors, which sounds very jolly and exciting. We haven't changed anything, but that's now what we have as our title. And in one of my, um, uh, one of my supervision groups, we used to spend the time talking about um, uh, human sexuality in terms of biology. Um, we did a course uh, called Reproductive uh, Human physiology. And one of the things that we taught these lovely second-year medics, that they mostly taught themselves, is how complicated sex is. And by sex, I mean 
the physicality that, that what we mean by um, uh, in terms of uh, not not in terms of sex as a as a verb but sex as a noun and from that discussion it's very clear that what most of us think about as how the body works is not entirely correct so it's very simple for us when we're thinking about sex to say uh, and we hear this, and you hear it if you read, if you have the misfortune of being on Twitter or any other form of, of social media, firstly, um, why, and secondly, um, this is what you'll see, which is X, Y is male, and X, X is female. How difficult can that be? And this is thrown at people all the time. Well, it's just not true. It's not true from a variety of reasons, but it's not even true from a genetic sex point of view. So some of you may have much more knowledge on this than others, but the very simple thing being that there's a very small region on your Y chromosome, um, which is the male chromosome. And by the way, female is normal. Male is the aberration. Female is normal. The X chromosome, you can, you can live without a Y chromosome. You cannot live without an X chromosome. So that's a little bit of help for us all. But, but the, the, the Y chromosome essentially contains one tiny, tiny little gene. It's called a transcription factor, and it basically determines whether um, we stop the female processes from developing and uh, enable the male processes to develop. It's a tiny little region. Now, in the ma vast majority of people, you find that little region on the Y chromosome, but not in all. So, you can be an XX male. All you need is that little tiny transcription factor, one little protein, to be found on the wrong chromosome. So, you start off with... XY is not male. SRY is male. That little region. Unless it's damaged, at which point you can be an XY genetic female. Because if you've not got the SRY region working, then you don't have uh, any way of preventing the female normal development from occurring. So that's at the genetic level before we go anywhere else. And there are all kinds of weird and wonderful things that can happen with the genes. But that's only genetic sex. The problem is genetics is not enough. And the SRY region interacts with other things as well, including testosterone, which can then lead to the development of gonadal sex. Gonadal sex being the next kind of thing that we talk about when we think about sex, and that is uh, essentially which sex organs are you producing. And in some people, in hermaphroditism, in primary hermaphroditism, you can form one sex organ of one and one sex organ of the other with different genetic backgrounds beneath it or in some people with secondary hermaphroditism, some of the other processes that are working don't produce the right, compared to the um, genetic sex, don't produce the right plumbing, essentially. So you end up with an XX female who might have a male soma uh, gonadal sex, or vice versa. Then you go even further, and you have the anatomical sex, or the, uh, the sex that we would see um, so we're thinking about external sex organs, we're thinking about secondary sexual characteristics, meaning things like hair, um, breast development, um, skin development, those kind of things. Body shape. And that's another level of sex, which once again can be impacted by all these different things at different stages. So in the first instance, we need to get away from the idea that sex is X, Y, and that's the end of it. It ain't. So, why is this important? Because we have people for whom those sexes do not align. And I'm not talking here about transgender people. I'm talking about people for whom the innate biology does not align within those three different states. Now, why does that matter? Because if you go to talk to somebody and talk about marriage and say, so, someone who has female external sexual characteristics but male internal characteristics and is XY, who should they marry? Now... The normal response to this question is, well, these kind of things don't matter and it's only a very rare group of people and the rest of it. That is not a Christian answer. There is not a, it is not a Christian answer to say rarity means it doesn't matter. Because if we believe that everybody is built and born in the image of God, then everyone who is born in the image of God, anyone who, everyone who is made in the image of God, we must have some kind of response to them from our theology. So theology that, does not enact, uh, that, that is not able to deal with um, what is essentially normal human variation is not valid theology. So, 
That's another key tenet. If our theology cannot interact with reality, if we talk about theology that is based entirely on what we um, would like the world to look like rather than what the world actually is like, then our theology is at best defective and at worst dangerous. So, all of that said, where do we go? I want to talk a little bit about the underlying theology of where I get to for some of this stuff. I want to talk a little bit about, um, and, and that includes biblical, uh, bi biblical understanding. What I'm not going to do is proof text. I'm not going to go through the whole Bible and say, when it says this, it actually means that, or actually we can ignore this, or see, it's all very clear. But I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to just give a very brief description of how I would read the scripture. Um, I'm going to think a little bit about uh, where the Church of England is now and some of the sort of psychological um, theory that we might apply to where we are as a church, um, which I'm somewhat amazed has not been done in more detail before. The church is a fabulous organism for psychological yeah, investigation. Um, and then I, we might look at the... Pro and, and sadly, I think it probably hasn't been done because it's irrelevant to so many people who are interested in sociological and psychological societal engagement. So I think that's a really bad thing. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we might mean by gift, because part of the um, discussion of my book is, or well, one part of the title is gift. So, one of the things which I think we need to do when we're talking about our theology, or when we're, when we're engaging with, with queer theology, is to be clear that we are talking about identity. We're talking about the complexity of how identities merge and interact and sometimes are in tension with one another. For me, a very clear sign that theology is working, that theology has some validity to it, and it's always contingent, but that there's some validity to what we're doing, is that beneath our theological, or with our theological work, or through our theological work, we are not putting people in a position where they have to believe different things at the same time. Now, we all believe different things at the same time. We all do. It's part of human nature. Um, simple examples being that, uh, and, we've, and we all have, and we all have um, completely uh, contradictory uh, views or hopes or wishes. So I like to eat pizza, and I also think I should go to the gym more. And I think both of those things at the same time, and that's fine. And we can tolerate that level of low-level cognitive dissonance. And when I see a pizza, I think I really need to lose some weight, but I also really want cheese. And so I will go and have the cheese. And that's how we all exist. It's how we've always existed. It's how humans have existed through for, for generations. And it's ultimately a facet of human evolution. But in a theological sense, what we cannot do is start telling people two things which cannot be reconciled in Christ. And for me, if we're starting to tell people that, um, that the way that they have been created is in fundamental and makes uh, and the way that they should they should exist in their created order makes them unhappy and i mean unhappy in the truest sense that is does not enable them to flourish rather than that might be painful at times because we all have pain in our lives and lots of the ways that we want to act are ways which we shouldn't act but if we actively go against individuals human flourishing then i have a big concern that our theology is truly doing what it should be doing so I'm always on the lookout, and my antennae are always up for when we start to tell people to do things which are self-evidently unhelpful for them. And one of the self-evident things for me, being a psychiatrist, is the psychological impact on individuals. And we, these are very simple things, and they're things that you, know, you can get from Psychology 101 pop psychology books, looking at cognitive dissonance, looking at things like repression and so on. And yet, we do it as a church, and yet we talk about them as the valid theological perspectives of the church, and we also will not challenge them. We will not name them, and therefore we will not challenge them. And what I've tried to do is to name some of those things and then challenging them. So we are talking about identity, and we're talking about identity and flourishing at the same time. What we're not saying, and this is again something which is often thrown at um, people who are engaging in queer theology, is that um, we find our identity in being, for, so for me, in being a gay man, rather than in Christ. That's a false contradiction. I find my identity in Christ as a gay man, and that's fine. We all find our identity in Christ as who we are. 
Being gay is part of me, no less than being straight is part of someone else. The fact that I must name it and engage with it in a different way is because society, and the church in more widely, has seen it as being an aberration. But all of us find our identity in Christ as ourselves. And it is through finding our identity in Christ as ourselves that leads to true human flourishing. So it is a question of identity, but it's not a contradiction. It's not in opposition to our identity in Christ. So let's have a quick think then about the Bible and about how we're engaging with the scripture. So I said I wasn't going to do proof texting, not least because it's boring, um, and also because it's pointless, and also because it's been done before, um, and also because it's futile. So there are a number of different reasons. You can pick whichever one you don't want to do it for. But I would suggest doing a bit of reading, if you want, around some of those proof texts. And proof texts being single lines in scripture which show you that human sexual behaviour is only between a man and a woman. Now, I think you can read... um, uh, uh, Christian the- oh, you can read the Bible in, in a variety of different ways. Um, one thing you can do is to start from the perspective that um, the current teaching of the church is absolute. So we can say sex, and, and the current teaching of the church, and this is the Church of England, um, and other churches have their own views, but the Church of England's perspective is quite clear at the moment. Whilst we're debating it and engaging with it and mostly ignoring it, it is quite clear And it's quite clear in that uh, sex is for marriage, a marriage, uh, sex is for procreation, ultimately. Sex is there, and procreation and sex should only be within marriage. Marriage is for a man and a woman because it requires the procreative element. Therefore, there should be no sex outside of marriage. Because marriage is between a man and a woman, there should be no same-sex sex. sex. Full stop. And it's quite neat, in a sense. It's sort of, it's coherent. It's wrong, I think, but it's coherent. And so that's where we're starting from. So we're starting from a perspective that it is not possible, it's almost a category error for us to start talking about sex between two people of the same sex because the sex must be procreative. That can only be within marriage and so on. Now, very simple for us to tear that apart. We can all tear that apart. We all know that sex in in marriage is not always procreative. The the Lambeth Conference, by the way, that great beast of despair, the Lambeth Conference, spoke about this a long time ago, I think it's almost 100 years ago, accepted contraception. The minute you accept contraception, you accept that sex is not for procreation only. That is simply a fact. And yet we continue to peddle the idea that sex is for procreation, must be within marriage, that's the only place where it happens. So, why then do we get so obsessed, this is a question, a genuine question, although one with, I think, a simple answer, why do we get so obsessed about gay sex and not about straight, non-procreative sex. I think the answer to that is homophobia. I think that's ultimately a societal pressure. A societal pressure that may be driven by evolutionary forces, but nonetheless is a societal pressure. So that's one thing. So that's the current teaching of the church. And so you can go through the Bible and find all the reasons why the Bible supports the current teaching of the church. Now, I think that's quite lazy, but it's what we do. And some of the debates that have come out about sexuality and human sexuality in recent years have essentially started from the point of this is the teaching of the church. Now let's find reasons to support it. And I think there are verses in the scriptures, if you find them, that are supportive of that particular perspective. I think that's probably fair enough. Some people would disagree, but I think it's probably fair enough that that at least a reasonable interpretation of some of those verses might say that. So we can say to those verses, either we can say, Yep, fully accept. That's what they're referring to. There's nothing positive about same-sex relationships in Scripture. This is usually the position that's put forward. There's nothing positive said about same-sex sex sex in Scripture. And anything that might be said in it is probably negative. So therefore, it's forbidden. And it doesn't matter the questions of human flourishing. It doesn't matter about whether this is bad for people's development and sexual development and psychological development and everything else. None of that matters because God knows what he's talking about. God speaks through scripture, end of story. That's one perspective. I don't think it's a very good perspective, but it's one perspective. Another perspective is to take those verses and go, I don't matter, spin those. And to be honest, we do actually do that with some scripture. So any of you that have the misfortune of, of, of reading through um, the, the Common Worship Daily Office book on a, on a regularly, relatively regular basis will notice that Firstly, there are some pretty abysmal passages in there. Some of them are abysmal because they're pretty horrible. Some of them are abysmal because they're just so dull. And sometimes the church does not use them. So when I was talking about being a chorister in Chichester, um, 
that, that wonderful psalm, or for those of you of a certain generation, the Boney M song by the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept. That psalm does not end in the cheeriest way possible. Blessed is he that taketh thy children and dasheth them against the stone. Seems a bit much. And in Chichester, that verse was gloriously asterisked. So there was a little asterisk next to it, and underneath it said, we do not sing this. <laughs> so we just didn't sing it. Now, there's debates to go on until the cows come home about what we should and shouldn't do with difficult passages of scripture. But that is an example of binning the ones we don't like. And there's all kinds of slightly dodgy interpretations where we say, well, it's the Old Testament, and so we shouldn't really... In it. And then the Old Testament God is different to the New Testament God, which becomes a dodgy anti-Semitic, I think, argument, and also a Marcion an argument of let's bin the Old Testament and just focus on the New Testament, which ignores the Jewishness of Christ and the use of, his, of the scripture throughout both Christ's life, teaching, and through St. Paul's writing too. But we can do that. So we can bin it. We can bin that on the same sex verses if we think that's what they relate to. Or we can constantly reinterrogate our faith when we meet those passages. And we can constantly reinterrogate those passages in the context of what we know about human flourishing and what we know about what the Bible says, I've pointed to my book there as though it was the Bible, what the Bible <laughs> says about human flourishing. So we can look at what the Bible's overarching vision and statements say about human flourishing. And we can read it from a biblical perspective. So there is a biblical perspective on human flourishing, I think. And I think a lot of what the Bible says in its entirety and through, its, um, through seeing it through the life of Christ and through seeing it through the history of Christian church says a lot of good stuff about relationship. What I think the Bible is saying, with these passages included, but yet interrogated and refined, and with our theology and doctrine refined and interrogated through those passages and through using the rest of scripture, what I think the Bible is saying is, there is something that is good to be found in relationships, there is the good relationship, there is the relationship that leads to human flourishing, and there is the relationship that does not lead that way. And if we approach these verses from what is the innate, what is the heart, what is the centre of what the scriptures are telling us, I think the centre of the scripture is relationship. The centre of the scriptures, the Bible and, uh, well, depending on whether, whether you're more Protestant or more Catholic, the Apocrypha and various other things, the Bible and the scriptures, the writing of the early church, the, the direction of church history is towards good relationship. Good relationship and covenant between God and, the, and Israel in the, in the Jewish Bible, in the Jewish scriptures. Relationship between Christ and all people in the, in the New Testament. And indeed, a, a, a prefiguring of that relationship in the Old Testament too. That's what the Bible is actually talking to us about. It's talking to us, a, it's a narrative, a love story narrative between God and humankind. Which can be imaged and seen and reflected in the love stories between human beings, whether that's sexual love or whether that's not sexual love. And the big question we then need to ask ourselves is, so are we saying that gay people or LGBT people should be prevented from particular expressions of that love? So a context, a, a, a phrase which I've come to use in the book a number of times, which is probably not copyright me, it's probably copyright someone else, is the idea of relational sexuality. What I think the current prohibition on same-sex sex is, is actually a prohibition on relationship. Because relationship, sex, is in the context of relationship, not always, but in the context of relationship, an expression of that relationship. It is not something separate from relationship. And in so being, because of humans reflecting something of the relationship of God with us, it must in some sense, when it is good and holy, notice not pure, when it is good and holy, it must reflect something of the goodness and holiness of God as well, and of the relationship of God for uh, God's people. So I think if we start to remove sex, if we try to um, instrumentalise sex, if we try to talk about sex as things that happen rather than recognising sex as part of the context of relationship then we end up in a place where we are ultimately forbidding LGBT people or um, people who are wanting to have sex with someone of the same sex 
in t- we are forbidding them from developing a level of relationship. That, for me, is a very different thing than saying this shouldn't go there. Which brings me on to the point about sex. And I'm sorry, it's a sort of, um, a sort of late evening, and you probably don't want to hear about sex very much, but you have come to a queer theology lecture, so what do you expect? <laughs> I'll be gentle with you. Um, we can look at sex from a variety of different ways. Um, one question I love to ask, um, not in general, not sort of down the street, but to people who are having these debates, what do you mean? They say, oh, you know, sex, sex should be for marriage only. I say, what do you mean? What, what is sex? It's usually this sort of, you know, well, you know, it's a bit, you know, say, yes, fine, that's penetrative sex, that's fine. Is that what you're talking about? That that's the only thing that should be kept within marriage? Well, no, and, and also, by the way, you know, um, without wanting to put too fine a point on it, vaginal penetrative sex, um, with, you know, penile vaginal penetrative sex can only happen between two people of the same sex. You know, that, that's kind of how it happens. Um, but if we start to say, well, it's about penetration, then we say, okay, fine. Um, that's the only thing that should be kept within marriage then. So everything else is fine. No, 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 every, no, no, because it's, it's sex more generally. It all needs to be kept fine. So it's not about penetration. What is it about? Well, and usually it's undenied and so on. And then my wonderful, my favourite phrase that comes out is, well, it's what you wouldn't do with a friend. And this came to me once. This was said to me once by a chaplain in Cambridge and I, when, when I was a student there after I was winding them up for a bit. And I remember thinking... Have you lived? You're a chaplain in Cambridge and you genuinely think that sex is what friends don't do. You know, this is 20, well, it's about 2011 at that point. I mean, come on. So it's a terrible definition, <laughs> even in terms of the reality of the, the environment in which this person was living. But that, in a sense, shows how far away we were from reality. But also, it doesn't really work. Because, or if it does work, it brings in those dangerous words, culture and context. So what we're actually saying is that sex has a contextual or cultural basis to it. What we determine as sex has a context behind it. Now, a good example of that would be holding hands. Most people wouldn't call that sex, but some people call it sexual, part of a sexual act. So I've spent a long time in my late teens and early 20s in um, dioceses across uh, West Africa. And holding hands, two people of the same sex, crossing the road there is completely normal. It's totally straight doing that. That would be, and it would be bizarre if you suggested that that was some kind of sexual. If you walk down the, ha- the street holding someone's hand of the same sex in, in Brighton, um, and in Hope actually, um, or, or in, in, in London or wherever you are, that is almost certainly, in the contextual sense, going to be seen as that there is some kind of relational element to what you're doing and probably a sexual relationship. Now, not in all cases, but in most cases. That means that that act is not what matters. It's not whether flesh touches flesh in that case. There's a context behind that action, and that context determines whether something is sexual or not. And obviously that's a very light option, but if you keep going through different things, you can begin to think there are actually, there's always a level of context to those things which determine them as sex or not as sex. Unless we determine that there are very particular things which are sex and they must be kept within marriage. But that doesn't work when it all breaks down into what you can and cannot get away with with people. So I think we need to be cognizant of the, the importance of context and culture in what we're talking about, particularly when we're talking about sex and sexuality. Um, so for me, what goes where doesn't work anymore. We have to move beyond that. And in a sense, and, and um, I've used this phrase in front of my partner, and I, he hasn't given me a smack for it, so I'm going to use it again. In a sense, knowing what is or is not sexual is very much easier when you're in relationship. Because you can say, I can't do that, or I shouldn't do that, because that would be breaking the covenant between me and the person with whom I'm committing myself. So there is, we understand sex in relationship, and we best understand what is and what is not sexual within relationship. So I think we need to, so, so back to the point about relational sexuality, if we are then saying sex is um, Ultimately, a, um, is ultimately a, 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 a relational element, we're then actually saying to people, gay people, I use that phrase just because I'm talking about myself in a sense, gay people cannot form the same nature of relationship as straight people. Now that is a very different thing than talking about what goes where, why and how. 
we're saying that gay people cannot form the same nature of relationship. And that God has created people who are forbidden and unable, who are forbidden from doing certain things, but who themselves are unable to express and attain even that level or that nature of relationship. That's a very, very different question. And I actually think gets to the heart of what we're talking about when we talk about sexuality and when we talk about uh, relationship and when we talk about the opening up of the church's rules, as it were, on sexuality. And we have focused so much on what goes where and we haven't focused nearly enough on the relational sexuality element. So I might just sort of, um, uh, and, and I might just read you a bit from, not from actually, it's from the from common worship, which is not something I would normally spend too much time reading from. Um, but there is the common worship introduction to marriage. It says this. Oh, actually, the Book of Common Prayer introduction to marriage is just worth reading because this is, this, is our, this is our doctrine, by the way. Remains our doctrine. Dearly beloved, we're gathered here together in the sight of God and the face of this congregation and so on and so on and so on. First, marriage was ordained for the procreation of children to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Now, I would ask you whether procreation uh, is uh, possibly a wider term than simply the production of children, but perhaps we could talk about that in the questions. Secondly, and it talks about nurture here. Fear and nurture of the Lord is part of procreation, not just doing the deed. Secondly, it was ordained as a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication that such persons as have not the gift of continency might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. I wish I could use that. I love it when people say we want a BCP wedding. I think I'm marvellous. Um, <laughs> thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort that one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity, into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. And that, by the way, is a radical Cramnerism an exciting, interesting, new part of marriage. And we can talk about marriage, because I think marriage is really important. We can talk about marriage possibly in the questions if that's something that people are interested in. But in the Common Worship booklet, it's even more clearly spelled out, but along the same lines as what Cramner introduced. It says, it is given that with delight and tenderness, this is marriage, it is given that with delight and tenderness, they may know each other in love, and through the joy of their bodily union, may strengthen the union of their hearts and lives. Are we really saying that gay people can't do that? The answer is, yes, we are, as a church, if we forbid gay people same-sex marriages in our churches. That's really, and that is the heart of what we're talking about here. That's relational sexuality. They've done it. They've done the work. I was looking for a good definition, and I stumbled upon the Common Worship Marriage Booklet as a definition of the concept I was trying to use to argue against Common Worship Marriage. Fascinating. So, um, just to give you a kind of brief insight, and I've got about five minutes left, so you, it's almost time for questions and then another drink, I think. So, just to give you an insight as to how the book works, the first book, bit of the book looks at um, Bible and, and kind of modern understandings of science in a bit more detail than I talked about. The middle section looks at the absolute catastrophe that the current Church of England has got itself into on this topic, looking at, and I look at, um, I compare sort of um, uh, a variety of different um, uh, 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 pairs of, of concepts. Um, and so I look at um, uh, expression versus repression, what a church of ex repression looks like and what a church of expression might look like. I look at openness versus erasure, so being honest and open about who we are versus telling people they must not talk and what the, what the outcomes of that might be. I look at the, vol the role that power and fear has played compared to vulnerability. The church has ultimately become a vehicle of power and fear. We can talk about that again if people are interested. And then think about inclusion and exclusion. Inclusion, which means the gay people that we're talking about are already part of the church. They're already included within the church. It's not the church talking to or at other people. It's talking about and with people within its ranks. So that's the second part. And then in the third part, I try and look at marriage and, and the Eucharist and gifts that might, that might come from, from, from um, queer folk and what benefits looking at this question might bring us. So I think I might just sort of finish by talking about some of those gifts. So one of them, I think, 
And people often say, so what is the gift of LGBT people? But we keep turning up, I think, is one of the biggest gifts. <laughs> We're still here. And that is odd. It's odd that we keep doing it. Why do we keep doing it? And ultimately, people say to me, well, why, do you, why are you still in the church? And my honest response is because I think it's true. Because I think that what happens at the Mass matters. I think that God did create the world. I think that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I buy into the Nicene Creed. I'm pretty boringly orthodox. Because I think it's true. But yet we still keep coming despite all this stuff being thrown at us. And I, I think it's probably true of Chichester, although it certainly used to be. I don't know if it's true now. But certainly in Southwark. I mean, you say, what, one of the wonderful things that we have said in the past was, well, why don't you just sack all the gay clergy then? Start with the clergy. Sack all the gay clergy. Who's going to look after your churches, sunshine? Because they're all, and it's, and it's a serious point. Now there's sociological reasons for that and so on. But if you got rid of all the gay clergy and then you got rid of all the gay laity, you said, if you are uh, LGBTQI, you're not welcome in the Church of England, you must leave. <sighs> okay, we'd have churches. There'd certainly be some churches left. But there wouldn't be nearly so many and they would certainly not have the same gifts that they currently have. So that's a ser- there is a serious point to that. Now, I think we're coming to a point in the church's decision-making process where um, we will make a decision probably in February or a decision we brought to the church in February, the wider church, about what we call marriage and how we engage with people in the same-sex relationships. I think if we don't say that uh, we have valid differing opinions, then, the, then if we're being really purist, back to that word, but if we're being really honest as well, we should then say not only, and forgive me because this is harsh what I'm saying, but we should not say we're not doing the marriages of same-sex same couples. We should say we're not doing their funerals either. And I say this because about 12 weeks ago, I did the um, memorial service. I did prayers at the memorial service of someone in my congregation who, um, who, has been, who was with his partner since before it was legal. And when they were alive, I was explicitly forbidden by the Church of England to say any prayers for them as a couple. Explicitly forbidden. Dead, no problem. That's iniquitous. But that's the reality. Why do we do that? Well, it's pastorally appropriate. So I could call him his husband in front of the church, in front of, in fact, quite senior people in the church who'd come to this, to this ceremony. But, but actually, if we're being honest, if we're actually saying that the, that the, the view that, that gay people cannot express relational sexuality in the same place as straight people can, if we're saying that, we should be clear and consistent in everything we do. And I actually think that ends up in a very difficult place for us as a Church of England. And I think we need to kind of push that a bit and say, is that really what we say? Is that really what we mean? So, people keep turning up. That's one gift. I think I've mentioned that um, if we take the Bible and we focus on the peripheries, we end up with sometimes quite a sort of obtuse and bizarre doctrines based on the peripheries rather than saying, so, you know, we would focus on those things which St. Paul says in one line, um, which we then don't apply or don't see in the rest of Scripture, or maybe St. Paul does or doesn't say it. So, one of the things that addressing people on the margins is and thinking of people on the margins as being equally valid and worthy of human flourishing is to make us constantly refine and interrogate our theology and our scripture and our reading of scripture that's not to say we place human experience above scripture it's saying that we bring human experience and science which is a gift of god to our interpretation and interrogation of scripture if we don't do that we're in trouble so i think we can See a gift of refinement, not of redefinition of refinement. I don't think we're redefining marriage. I think that we are refining how we understand it. We are reinterrogating it, and we are recognising that marriage can be opened to more than opposite sex couples. Again, I can talk about that more. It's interesting. So I think it's a gift of refinement. I think it's a gift of turning up. There is always a gift from the margins. So whenever we see people on the margins, and we um, and we recognise that that is where Christ is found then we need to spend more time uh, addressing those people and addressing those people in our theology and recognising that they are the church as much as we are. Pope Francis had the phrase, a poor church for the poor, which I like in many ways. But it's also a poor church of the poor. And so the the minute that we start saying we're doing something to others, 
rather than alongside others or with others, I think we end up in the wrong place. And I think gay people amongst, or LGBT people amongst a whole host of other people constantly bring us back. And um, we've been seeing that a lot in recent years with, with um, the sort of moves towards racial justice in the church. Again, a lot of the language, if you read some of the language around racial justice, it's what we can do for, what we can do for other people, as opposed to saying our starting point is these people are the same children of God that we are. And that's where we should be starting from. And we're really bad at doing that. I think um, queer people give the church a, the gift of Eucharistic life. They remind us, and that's, that sort of follows on from that, that reminds us who the host is. When we come to the Lord's table, we don't come as the host. Even the priest isn't the host, even though we sometimes like to think about We're not. The host is Christ. And so when we're starting to say that people may or may not baptise the children of same-sex couples, we're putting ourselves in the place of the host and not Christ. The same in tr is true in terms of receiving the Eucharist. We're placing ourselves as the gatekeeper where Christ says all are welcome to the table. So I think, that's, so I think we, we show a better understanding of what the Eucharist is. I think LGBTQI people have the gift of honesty and courage for the church, something which is, I think remains remarkable, that people are willing to um, stand up and say these things and are willing to be essentially cast out and seen as, as lesser. But sometimes courage happens because we can't shut up. Sometimes courage happens because there is no other way of being ourselves and people are no longer willing to be not themselves. And so actually, but that brings and breeds courage into an institution which desperately needs it. And I think also LGBTQI people um, challenge secular norms and truly get the church to start thinking in countercultural ways, healthy, useful countercultural ways, rather than just endless, meaningless countercultural ways. So it challenges the idea of binarism. It challenges the idea... Um, of, um, of, of simple answers to things. Things are either right or wrong. Some things are, but there are lots of things where there's shades of grey. It makes awkward our conversations. It makes our theology awkward. And I think that's a gift. I think our theology should be awkward. And we should be able to say, don't know, or you might be right. And that's one thing I think those of us here have argued constantly for this inclusion for the last X number of years. And I'm like a whippersnapper compared to some of these folk. You know, Actually, most of us say we might be wrong. We might be wrong is a phrase the church really could do with learning. I think we challenge patriarchal norms in a way which is not still the case through the church. And we challenge them not because we necessarily challenge them from a, from a perspective of equality of the sexes, but we challenge them by saying, what are you actually talking about in the first place? What, is, what do we mean when we're talking about human flourishing or identity of individuals and the rest of it? Is that, is, is male and female he created them? Is it more important to focus on the he created them bit? Or is it more important to focus on the male and female bit? Is it more important to focus on the and or on the male and the female bit? And that's a big awkwardness that queer theology throws into the mix. And I think finally, it ultimately helps us reveal something about who we are as a church too. All of those things help us reveal where we are as a church. Two final points. In the Eucharistic prayer, uh, and I believe in the ordination of bishops, but I can't remember now, the, uh, one of the phrases that's sometimes used is uh, reveal her unity. Reveal her unity of the church. We hear a lot about unity. It is a blasphemy for us to say that we can create unity. The church is God's. Bad luck God, in many ways. The Church of England even is God's. Reveal her unity is a much stronger phrase than create a unity and much more about what we're about. And I'm going to finish with a word from Archbishop Justin, who I heard preach at the weekend. And it's a public record, so he said it, so I'm going to say it. He was preaching at the rededication of a church in London, and there were some things in that sermon which I didn't appreciate, but there were some things which were very good. And one of them was, he was talking about Lambeth Conference. He said, a thing that was different at Lambeth Conference is that I told the truth. And he didn't mean that he normally lies. He was talking about the, this specific question about the diversity of opinion in the Anglican Church. And he said what he ended up doing was simply naming the truth as it is. We have differences of opinion on this. And for me, that is something which is still radical for the church. But that in itself is a scandal, I think. 
but I think we need to name the truth that we have differences of opinion in it. And what we will see in the next few months, years, who knows, is whether we can too say that we recognise that when other people hold differences of opinions on these things, we can accept them as opinions which are met and, um, and received and understood in integrity, and that they're opinions which we're able to challenge rather than simply shut down. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, yeah, just shout something out. Or I don't know, it's, it feels very sort of teachery. You can put your hand up if you like. I, I brought up a question. I, yeah. I wonder what you say. When I look at Christianity, mm. I look at it in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. I believe the Bible from beginning to end, mm -hmm. from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But what I believe is that everybody should be included and no one should judge anybody else mm -hmm. because we don't walk in somebody's shoes. Mm -hmm. So we don't know their situation, their circumstances. Mm. Um, and or we should read the Bible and make sense of it, you know, with our own conscience and our mm. guidance as well. Yeah. But basically, it's not judge anyone whatsoever because we don't know mm. their situation. Their mm. Yeah, I think we don't know their situation is actually a phrase that we could use more. And we don't know is a phrase we could use more. The, the, someone once said, I can't remember who it was, um, to me, when I think it was at theological college, said, the Bible, the gospel is only good news if it's good news for everyone. And I thought, and it's a bit twee, and we can say that, and that kind of, you know, that sounds great. But actually, there's some serious truth behind that. And if you read some of the writing by people for whom the gospel, or what they would see as part of the gospel, the, the refusal to allow same-sex relationships, gay people who are writing about that, people who would say they're gay, but that they, they will remain celibate because they feel that the Bible tells them that that's what they must do. A huge amount of that writing is really sad. Like, really sad, as in I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean, it's, it's heart-rendingly sad because it's people struggling to try and say, but then how is this good news? Can, can I just yeah. Say, yeah, no, go ahead, Jack. Um, I understand what they're saying because mm. from my point of view, as I am not gay, so mm. I, it's something I don't understand. Mm. Mm. But what I would say in the Bible, that's loads of passages which are very difficult for me, mm -hmm. really, especially when it comes to children, mm -hmm. very difficult mm -hmm. to accept and very painful, and I would rather mm -hmm. not look at them, but they are there. Yep. So what they say in the Old Testament. But yeah, and we have to pray over them, and we have yeah. to see them within the context of Scripture. Yeah. And I think that's the other key thing, which and is... And doesn't stop me believing... Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. To, yeah. Would it behave yeah. in the best Christian possible Christian yeah. way, you know? Yeah. And different people respond to Scripture in different ways. But yeah. different people will read yeah. Scripture in different ways, and different people will have their own responses, I guess. I believe it can be guided, the Holy Spirit will inspire yeah. you to believe what, what yeah. is the right... Yeah. The and right. There's the, but also, I think there is an element of the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I think there is a sense that we also, you know, I think it's in Galatians, the end of Galatians. Um, we, oh, we've been reading Galatians in daily mass at the moment. I forgot how tiresome St. Paul is. I, he, oh, he's whinging on about Peter. And, oh, I told Peter this. And, they, oh, for goodness sake. Anyway, the end of Galatians, it goes, whereas in Ephesians it gets worse, in Galatians it gets better, I think. And towards the end of Galatians, Paul says, you know, that classic line, by their, by their fruits they shall be, you know, by the fruits of the Spirit. We'll, we'll, I can't remember the exact phrase or the translation. But I think there is something about looking at the fruits of people's lives as well and recognising that the Spirit works through lives, of how pe uh, through lives now as well as through Scripture. And I think we have to have a healthy balance of those two things. Yeah. Yeah. Charles, oh. <laughs> um, do, you, do you not think these things are sort of turned in, in the thing of scripture has only negative things yeah. to say towards the LGBTQIQ and science and what we know now, you know, to actually give us a different perspective? Hmm. Do you think that our scriptures have anything positive to say to LGBTQ people? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think what science does is help us refine the questions that we need to ask of scripture. So... So we can go around in circles for years arguing about um, what porneia means in scripture and what um, 
what words, whether um, whether the words refer to sort of male prostitutes or whether they refer, what, what, what are we talking about in scripture? We can go around. And I don't think there's actually a settled view on that, even though certain folk who I won't name would tell me they very clearly are. Um, so we can, I, we can take that kind of approach. Or we can actually say, um, is what scripture is talking about in terms of relationship and in terms of love and in terms of, you know, uh, 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 community and all those kind of other things which the scripture talks about, can we, can we you, is that good news for, for, for people in, who, are, who are sort of gay as well, LGBT as well? For me, those are the passages, rather than focusing on the kind of five or six lines which are both debated and not necessarily, and, and are certainly just lines that we find. They're not, they're, it's not, there's, there's no worked through theology of why uh, same-sex relationships are bad in scripture. It's not there. There's lots of discussion about why St. Paul would say that because it must be feeding into a Jewish viewpoint and the rest of it. And that. There's all of that kind of stuff. That's all, that's all supposition. It ain't in scripture. Yeah, so I think we need to, so I think what science and, and experience and so on does is get us to look at scripture, look at the bits of scripture which are actually speaking to the context in which we find ourselves rather than constantly going back to the same verses and saying, see, there's nothing positive there at all. So I think, there, so I think uh, you know, I, and, and, you know, I know, people get very upset about this particular use of story, but, you know, David and Jonathan, now people are saying, no, it's definitely not sexual. Of course it's not. I mean, there's something going on. <laughs> there's something going on. And whether we, whether we accept that that is actually what we would currently see as a same-sex relationship, I'm not sure that is. I think that's, I think that's probably pushing it too far. But it's talking about intimate love between two people of some form. And that does challenge our kind of, our innate feeling that, that, and it also challenges the idea that our current understanding of basically relationships are either entirely sexual or entirely sensual as being completely wrong as well. So I think the scriptures challenge us to get to the heart of what the question is, or the heart of what, this, of what God is trying to tell us through narrative. And we also need, just a very long answer to your question, sorry, but there's also, we also need to recognize that the bible is not one book and the more and more that we say that it's one book the more and more we do violence to it mm -hmm. so if we try and read the song of solomon or uh, we try and read the wisdom literature and the psalms and genesis and the gospel of luke in the same way we're going to end up in trouble because it's not the same type of writing um, if we continue to say that um, moses wrote um, uh, the first five books of the Bible, then we end up in a position where he writes after he's dead. So we're, it, it, there, there, and, and indeed, we know so much more about biblical lit and criticism and so on, about when things were written and how they're written and so on. And I think we need to take all of that to our understanding of scripture. And so I don't think it's just about LGBT people finding good news in scripture. It's about all of us addressing scripture in an adult way, which I don't think we've done, and which the church's discussion about LGBT issues frequently feeds back into a very childish way of reading scripture, which we have moved beyond in the way that we look at other questions of human flourishing. Well, I mean, I hope and pray, so there's, I think there's a structural element and then there's a local element. So I think structurally, I hope and pray that February there will really be a change. And I, I was meeting with some of the uh, Living in Love and Faith group who are, who are running the kind of ongoing process. And I, I left, I met, met them this morning. I really am a glutton for punishment. I did that, wrote my GP letters and came here. I really know how to live. Um, and, uh, but but I, I, I had a positive feeling from that meeting that there's a recognition um, that, and I'm not giving anything away because that's not what they said, it was my feeling from this me meeting, that there's a positive feeling that things are going to have to be more honest. And I think 
that is one thing which we struggle with as a Church of England at the moment, because the official Church of England position is sex is between man and woman, marriage, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's it. And there is no... And everything that we do on a local level, we, we're constantly fighting against this kind of you know, banner that's being held up. Yeah, but the real Church of England's position is this. So we might say, I have, you know, I have people come to me, can we get married in church? No, you can't. Oh, but you know you're in favour, you write with... Yeah, I can't, it's legal. So I can't, I can't do it. Like, we, can, we can find ways of doing things, but, and if I get busted, I lose my licence. That's it. Goodbye. So, so, so there's a structural element to it which needs to change. So one of the things we need to do is continue to push for that structural element to change. Because even though it might not impact us in our day-to-day -day congregations, it does impact us in our missional work, in our outreach work, and in our inability to actually be congregations that do what we want to do and do what we say we would want to do. On a local level, I mean, I think um, there's... So I think we should be more um, uh, one John and less James, in a sense, in terms of biblical texts. So quite a lot of the scripture is quite simple on some of this kind of stuff. Like, really quite simple. You know, the God is love stuff. And that's not the same as, kind of, you know, it's very easy to then say, God is love and, you know, everything's happy and everything's fine. Everything isn't fine. Like, everything isn't fine. We know that certain relationships are not fine. We know that certain behaviours are not fine. So God is love does not mean that you can do whatever you like, whatever you like. But what we need to do is therefore begin to ask those questions about what and how we do that kind of theology and questioning. How do we on a local level start to talk about the good news that scripture actually has for relationships? So I, I think too often we move from scripture doesn't say same-sex relationships are bad to so we don't really need to listen to scripture at all about relationships. And I think that's that's kind of writing the, or wronging the right, or I don't know quite the phrase, but we're tipping the ship over in the direction. So I think, I think we need to do the work and on a local level say that, that we have life-giving messages from scripture. I also think one of the things we need to do is to be honest about our disagreements. And I say that partly with a vested interest because I think one of the things that churches that are non-affirming of same-sex relationships need to do is to be more honest as well. And I think in a, because we're often telling young... The young people, I don't really worry about your young people in the, in the nicest possible sense, because I'm sure you're kind of giving them the options and be, giving them kind of thoughtful teaching and things. It, in some churches, people are still being told there is only one view on this. And in a sense, one of the things we need to do is to open up those conversations so that people at least know there are other places they can go to go and have these conversations. And that there are other perspectives held within the church. And even down the road, you know, that there are, you know, within, you know, I don't, I don't actually know anything about the theology of the churches here, I probably just put my foot in it, but, um, you know, that there are actually churches that have differing views. So I think, so I think what we need to do is to show that, that, that scripture is not something to be feared and to show our working when we're talking to young people. Because otherwise, it's so easy, and I see it in university students all the time, they see my dog collar if I'm accidentally dressed as a priest rather than as an academic. Um, if, if they see my dog collar, they immediately think I'm homophobic. Immediately. And so I've, got, I've, got, I've had a couple of gay students over the years who have been terrified about saying anything or you know, being honest about it. And then I suddenly think, oh, it's because of this. You know, we need to talk about a positive narrative of, of sexuality that takes scripture seriously, that takes church seriously, but that sees church as a genuinely nourishing place. But I think it's going to be increasingly difficult until we have the systematic or systemic changes as well. Yeah. So, realising that the church is full of gays, mm. more than uh, women and, and, and non gays This is, that's a really interesting question because it's something which I've just spent about three or four days talking about with groups who are pushing for same-sex marriage. Um, I'll, I'll answer it in a circuitous way. The reason it's really interesting is because one of the things that a lot of the groups who are opposing any change in the church's doctrine at the moment are saying is that the groups that are wanting to incre in include gay people in the church, the life of the church, hate marriage and don't want marriage. And the fascinating thing is, the great majority of these groups, these campaign groups, do want marriage. 
they're super pro-marriage. They're just pro-opening it up. They're not pro-getting rid of it. And so, and so I think that's, I think certainly in terms of what the direction of travel is, the wanted direction of travel from a large number of the campaign groups at the moment in the Church of England is opening up marriage, not getting rid of it. So people don't actually want blessings for civil partnerships. Some people do want civil partnerships and we can debate the kind of patriarchal nature of marriage and the, those kind of sort of um, feminist arguments about marriage, about whether or not it's an appropriate thing. Um, but actually a lot of people don't want blessings and civil partnerships. They want marriage and they want marriage in church because they, they believe that what's happening there is the same as what's happening in a straight couple. So I think marriage hasn't had its day yet. What now... Now, I always I have to be slightly careful because you, one does loads of work over the years to try and show that you're quite boring and orthodox, and then you end up screwing it up in the last minute. So I'm going to try not to do that. <laughs> does the que but do we need to ask wider questions? I sort of alluded to this, and I got away with it, I thought, but I didn't. Do we need to ask questions about what sex is for beyond marriage? Do we need to recognise that most, you know, you've got universities in this town or city, city, the town when I was young. Um, you know, you've got students in this city. Like, they're, they're not waiting for marriage. The reality is people are not waiting for marriage. Now, again, we can either say, well, so we need to find some pastoral way of engaging with that, or we need to start saying, are we absolutely sure that we can produce a coherent reason for why sex should only be for marriage? Now, I don't know that we can. Now, and, and do we need to start having the questions about whether all sexuality is relational or not? Because actually the big argument for me about marriage is that actually it's the relational sexuality that, that people who are opposing same-sex relationships actually have a problem with. It's the relational element. And almost, and, and particularly um, in certain parts of the church, which I might describe over a drink rather than on camera, um, there might be um, a willingness, essentially, for random sex to occur between people of the same sex as long as they go and confess it. And then you move on, because it doesn't have the relational element to it. Now, these are questions we need to be engaging with. But those questions are like here, and we are like there, outside the building. Because we haven't got beyond the debates about marriage in the first instance. So, I don't think marriage is a thing of the past. But I do think we need to have a fundamental rethinking of what sex is and why and how. I mean, I think that's a sociological question rather than a religious one now. Um, I, think, I think, sadly, the, church, the church's perspective on marriage is kind of old hat. I find it fascinating. If you read through the marriage ceremony, a lot of the marriage ceremony is basically an incredibly dull extended sermon on why marriage is a good thing. That's just, I mean, if you are doing marriage, I mean, you just could have, there's another page of preface, you know, Oh, and it's set up for this, and oh, you must do this, and you mustn't do that. But, but almost we, we've, those kind of days of the church having that kind of encouraging people to do marriage is kind of over. Most people, um, certainly in the mid-20th century, were looking towards marriage, and now it's kind of a decline in the other, the other end. Certainly, historically, marriage was not for everybody. Um, but again, back to what good news is there in the church for people, it's saying, so maybe the word marriage or the focus on marriage is not actually everything here. Because perhaps what our focus should be on is those things which marriage should be encapsulating, which is stability, the procreative nature, i.e. the joining in in the creative will of God, and the, product, the nurture of children, the bringing up of children, all of those things. But we've got so obsessed by the word marriage that we haven't focused on those elements that, 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 was, that was behind the whole thing in the first place. So I think the church has very little to say, particularly to, so to divorced people, um, uh, I think, I mean, the Roman Catholic Church has seen this in the last couple of years. I mean, just, you know, I still think it's astounding, but that's because I'm sort of dangerous liberal and was brought up in the United Reformed Church. But the, I think it's astounding that the position of the Church, the position of Church of Rome, is that marriage is an unforgivable sin, essentially. That you, and, and because if you if you go if you if you break up and if you divorce, that's it. No more communion. That, and that for me is a really astoundingly strong position. But we're not much better in some ways. Because if we go on about, you know, um, we pretend that the nuclear family is how everyone is living, it isn't. 
And yet, so therefore our good news that we have for people is not necessarily embraced. And we see that around Mothering Sunday and various other things as well, um, where Mothering Sunday is nowhere near. And people are now terribly worried about preaching on Mothering Sunday. I hate doing it. Because what do you say? Um, and the reality is you talk about the things which, you know, you, you step back and you think about what Mothering is about and what the church has historically had useful to say and bin some of the stuff that it hasn't got useful to say. But I agree. I mean, how, how do we engage with our current context is an absolutely key question. But the context has run away from us. And these are sociological questions now, which the church is completely ill, Ill, Ill adept to deal with. can repeat it. it's on video now all right allowing different people to have their own opinions um i guess it'd be useful for me to know mm. what is there a um at synod is, is, is there a, a particular view about whether people choose their sexuality mm. or not because mm. i work as a therapist and the vast majority yeah. So there's a great book that you... No, oh, no, 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 in all seriousness. I was going to say, yeah. I, was, I wish I had... Yeah, no, no. Thank goodness you put it in a book. Yeah, no, in all seriousness, the middle section of this book does address those kind of issues itself. So the answer to what you're saying is complex. <sighs> of course, because it's the Church of England. Are there people in... So I think Synod is a sideshow, by the way. I think Synod is a, I think Synod is a complete waste of time in, in most cases. Synod is not going to make any decisions in February. The bishops are going to bring something to Synod, and Synod will probably nod it through or not even been given a vote, because Synod has just become even more aggressive than the general election in terms of the elections. It's political, it's uninteresting, um, there is no way anything can get through because you need a two-thirds majority for anything serious. So Synod can go and shout at each other, and that's fine, lead them to it. The bishops have the authority to change everything, apart from enabling same-sex marriage as a service in church. The bishops can change everything else. So that's one, but that's just, that's the kind of side show. But there are groups in the Church of England, kind of pressure groups, and certainly represented at Synod, for whom I think that would be an open question for them. They, I think there are very few people now who would admit that to, to believing that one chooses one's sex, uh, sorry, that one chooses one's sexuality. But they exist. And examples of such people would be people who think that if you're gay, you have, and, and choice is an interesting word, because what do we mean by choice? But people who are, are, are gay should choose to, and men who are gay, mostly, interestingly, back to the patriarchal argument, men who are gay should choose to marry heterosexual women because that is God's ordained way for them. Doesn't matter if they become straight or whatever, but that's how they should be living because that's what God says in the Bible, end of story. And I think the questions around choice and about genuine choice and things are really important in this debate. Because that, for me, is not... Now, I try to be really generous in the book, really genuinely try to be generous to people who have a, an opposing perspective. I really struggle there. But one, because why is it women who once again have to pick up all the mess that men make? One, like, why is that? I mean, because that's history. That's how it always happens. But, so that's one issue. But, but the other thing is that that feels like an abusive theology. It feels like an abusive... I mean, if we were, you know, in practice, we wouldn't get away with that. If I said to my, if I, if someone came into my clinic and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll tell you what, 
mean, it's, it's ridiculous, it's laughable, it's absurd, but yet, theologically, we try and argue our way into that position. So I think, the, I think it tacitly, or even implicitly, those things exist in terms of perspectives. Um, do they have, um, what's the position of the Church of England? I think they probably would say there is no choice. Um, but, and I'll finish because I know I'll keep going on, Issues in Human Sexuality, which is the current teaching of the Church of England, written um, whilst I was being born um, and uh, published in 1991 um, and described at the time as cutting edge, um, remains in power, remains in, as the authority, and we must sign up to it to get ordained. And it basically says, the main reason we must sign up to it is because it tells us we can't have sex. That's, the kind of, that's, that's why Issues in Human Sexuality is there. Issues in Human Sexuality contains a, a line in it which says... Um, uh, if we found the gay, along these lines, if we found the gay gene, um, moral questions would come as to whether this should be eliminated from the population. Now, that is a really worrying phrase. I don't think that's cutting edge in 1991, but good God, it's 2022, and that's still the published position of the Church of England. So whether or not they think it's a choice, there is still an inherent, and it talks about homophiles, Dreadful, dreadful language. Homophiles, they thought it would catch on, it didn't. The idea that, and, and so all of those things are wrapped up. And now, okay, it's interesting as a historical document that we can put it on the shelf. It's not a historical document. It's in force. The bishops have been challenged about it at Synod, including my good mate and my May Christie, or May Luke, who's in the South, South London, who's cracking. And May has challenged this in Synod and been told, yes, I know, it's a bit difficult, hand ringy, hand ringy, hand ringy. But that's the current position of the Church of England. If you want to, you know, pour yourself a decent glass of something and then read Issues in Human Sexuality to see where the current position of the church is, do I think that is one, going to be one of the things that gets placed on the bonfire of nonsense in February? Good God, yes. But that's where we are now. And so whether or not it's a choice, it's definitely seen as inferior and it's definitely seen in words of disease if not in, it, or at least in the kind of terms of disease, if not in the actual words themselves. Yeah. Sorry, that's not a very positive way to end, is it? <laughs> but it's going to get better. It really is going to get better. And I do think there's going to be change. Should I write it down? Yes, please. And that, so just, I'm just going to do that plug. If you are, if you have been affected by any of the issues in today, do write to your bishops. Write to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Write to your bishops. They are currently in listening mode. <laughs> They're currently in listening right. mode. They are, li they are literally in something called listening. They are wanting to think and discern the way forward in the Church of England. There has never been as important a time as this to say things to your bishops. There's never been. That's why I wrote, that's why I sat down last October in a week and a half and wrote this book. Because I knew I need to take a week and a half off work and write the damn book, publish it, and then it was meant to all be decided in, in July. It wasn't, it's now a bit late, but never mind. This is the time to make the difference. And if there's going to be a difference, February is when the difference is going to be made. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charlie, for your depth of knowledge <laughs> and your humour as well in dealing with really complicated issues for us. It's been fabulous to have you here. Uh, we're going to say thank you and then we can have another drink and yes. a bit of a chat. We try to go up for that. Yeah, always, yeah. glass or something, I think. <laughs>